So now that we've got down our organization of the nervous system, including the CNS, PNS, and all of their various divisions, let's now take a look at what actually makes up the nervous system, the nerves. And if you'd like to review the organization of the nervous system before watching this video, click here to return to the previous one. So nerves are what carry information in our bodies, and like we talked about last time, nerves go in or out from the brain depending on which direction the signals are traveling, and we gave these special names. So we said that the incoming signal, or the afferent or sensory signal, brings information in, whereas the efferent, or motor signal, carries information out. And this is really just a distinction of which direction the information is traveling. What's really important here is that the signal actually get from where it's going to where it needs to be, be that in from the environment to the brain, or from the brain out to some part of the body. If you put your hand near this fire, for instance, like this hand I'm drawing here, your hand is going to send up an afferent signal into the brain, which is going to say, ow, move me away from this fire because this hurts. And your brain is going to send a signal down, which says, remove that hand before it gets hurt. This ability to quickly transmit a signal over a long distance is what makes nerves so special. And in this sense, we can imagine them just like telephone or internet wires because they quickly send signals from one place to another. So what makes up a nerve? Well, a nerve is really long and really thin, and it looks a lot like a really long wire. And when you draw it out, which I've done already, it looks just like this. Another name for a nerve, which we'll be using here from now on, is a neuron. And neurons are typically laid out end to end, so we'll draw the beginning of one over here and the end of one over here just to show that this neuron that we're working on is part of a neuron chain. Now there are three main parts to the neuron. The first of this, which I'm highlighting here in green, is called the dendrite. And I'll label that here. And each of these little projections off of the right side of this neuron here can be called a dendrite, or together they make up what's called the dendritic tree. This structure here I'm circling in orange, in which I'll put the nucleus, is called the soma, otherwise known as the cell body, and it contains all of the organelles, including mitochondria, the ER, and lots and lots of ribosomes. This long projection out here, which I'll show in red, gets a special name, and it's called the axon. So the three main parts here, again, are the dendrite, the soma, and the axon. So what's the function of each? Well, the dendrite serve is like an antenna, taking in lots and lots of signals that come in. The soma organizes all of these, and if a signal decides to be sent out, it's sent out down along the axon, out to the next cell. Now, real-life neurons inside of your body can be really, really long, and some of them extend from your spinal cord all the way down to the tip of your toes, which can be a distance of three or four feet in some really tall people, which is a pretty long way for one cell. So the signal travels all the way down to the end of the axon, to this part right here, which gets a special name, and because it's at the end of the axon, we call it the axon terminal. And this is going to be really important later on when we talk about the transmission of the signal across this gap right here, which also gets a special name, and we'll call that the synapse. Now there's a few other structures that are worth mentioning here. The axon looks thick in some places and thinner in others, and that's no accident. These thicker parts are actually another cell, which is called a Schwann cell. So we'll label these here. And these Schwann cells make a material called myelin. And myelin is a great biological insulator, which means it protects the signal as it travels all the way down this axon, which remember can be three or four feet long in some parts of the body. So the function of the myelin is to prevent the signal from degrading and allow the signal to travel faster than it would without the myelin present. These spaces between the Schwann cells are really important as well, and these have a special name, and they're called nodes of Ranvier. And I'll go ahead and write that out for you. Nodes of Ranvier, named after the person who discovered them. And these will become important later on when we talk about the propagation of a signal down the axon. So what happens when the signal reaches the axon terminal? How does it jump across the signal to the next neuron if they don't physically touch? Let's take a look at that now. So I'm going to go ahead and redraw our synapse that we saw above just a little bit bigger so that we can see all of the relevant details. So we have these two neurons coming together, and if we say the signal is coming down this way, this neuron before 
the synapse, the one that sends the signal, we'll call this one the presynaptic neuron. And the neuron that receives the signal and continues it on, we'll call the postsynaptic neuron. Now because there's this physical space, the synapse between these two neurons, there has to be something that actually transmits this signal across the space. And this job falls to a very special class of chemicals called neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters do exactly as their name says. They transmit the signal through the nervous system, hence the name neurotransmitters. And I'll just abbreviate these for future use as NTs. And there's lots of neurotransmitters, and I'll just put down a couple of them here. You might see ones like dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine is a major one in both the CNS and with your muscles, and norepinephrine. And this is not an exhaustive list. There's lots and lots of neurotransmitters, but these are just some of the major ones you may come across. So these neurotransmitters are kept in little bags in the presynaptic neuron, in the presynaptic axon terminal, called vesicles. And when this signal comes down this neuron and reaches the end, this induces these vesicles to open up and release these neurotransmitters into the synapse. And they go across to the postsynaptic neuron and interact with a receptor and cause the signal to continue on into the postsynaptic dendrite to be summed by the soma and out via the postsynaptic axon and so on and so forth until the signal reaches its final destination. Now before we can get into the details about how the signal travels, we need to talk a little bit about one other extremely important piece of information, and that's the resting potential. Now this gets a bit into physics and electrical theory, but suffice to say for now that a potential is really just another term for separation of charge. Now we know that opposite charges attract. So if we had, say, a group of positive charges over here and a group of negative charges a little bit away, these two groups of charges are going to be attracted to one another. So the positive charges are going to want to move towards the negative ones, and the negative charges are going to want to move towards the positive ones. This means that if you could separate positive and negative charges from one another, you've created a force between them. And this force can be used to drive the movement of charge. This is exactly what the neuron does by putting a barrier between the positive and negative charges. The barrier that the neuron uses is its cell membrane, and in doing so, it creates a separation of charge, or a potential, across its membrane. So we'll denote the outside of the cell here with an O, and the inside with an I. Now this separation of charge is used by the neuron to propagate the signal, and in our next video, we'll look at the full details of this. So this resting potential measures how much charge separation is present, and for the neuron, it's approximately negative 70 millivolts, which means that the inside of the cell has a negative charge with respect to the outside of the cell by an amount approximately equal to 70 millivolts or so. And while there are lots of ions present in the cell and in the extracellular environment, it's potassium that mostly contributes to the generation of the resting potential. And it's critical for this and for our next video to know that potassium is very high inside the cell and very low outside whereas sodium has the opposite. It's very high outside the cell, but very low inside the cell. Now each of these ions feels two forces in this setup. It feels an electrical charge attracting these positively charged ions towards the negative inside of the cell. And they each feel a concentration force, where they're being pushed from regions of high concentration to regions of low concentration. So potassium is being pushed out by its concentration force, but pushed in by its electrical force because it's attracted to the negative inside of the cell. Sodium feels an inward electrical force attracted to the negative inside of the cell and an inward concentration force because it has a higher concentration outside than inside. Now it's the combination of the electrical and concentration forces which determine which direction these ions will move. And together, they're given the name the electrochemical gradient. At rest, no ions are moving because the membrane is impermeable. The electrochemical gradient dictates how the ions would move only if the membrane were to suddenly become permeable to one of them. As we'll see in our next video, this selective permeability is the key to understanding the transmission of signals down the neuron.